So, welcome everybody to today's Zoom webinar with guest speaker, Mr. Long, who's going to speak to us about um, how to ace grade eight music theory. I realize it's not one that we often get asked to teach. So um, even when we are asked to teach it, we're always a little bit out of practice. So really appreciate Mr. Long giving his time tonight to share with us his wisdom from many years of teaching theory to many students, both his own and other people's students who wanted to learn theory. So with no further ado, I will hand the flu. Can you turn off the sound of the computer? Um, I will hand the floor to Mr. Long. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So thanks for having me here. Today, I'm going to talk about ABRSM grade eight theory and share some of my uh, tips and experience with you. So ABRSM grade eight music theory is quite a well-respected qualification. People worldwide take this exam because they think it brings value to them. And I've taught students from Hong Kong, from the UK, from Australia, and from France uh, who, who, want, who wanted to learn uh, grade eight theory. And it is currently the highest level music theory exam ABSM offers. So this is the top level. There's no diploma uh, theory exam from ABSM. If you want to take deep ABRSM in teaching, you need grade six music theory or higher. And if you want to take the LSM in teaching, you need grade eight theory. Grade eight theory used to be the prerequisite for performing diploma also, but that's no longer the case. Actually, the uh, whole reason for me to learn grade eight theory way back when was because I wanted to take the ABRSM performing diplomas. And at the time, it was a prerequisite. But by the time I got to actually taking the diplomas, it was no longer the, the uh, prerequisite. So I got stuck with, uh, with my qualification, but looking back, it was not a bad thing to, to learn. So why should anybody take grade eight music theory? Well, first of all, it helps with grade six to eight oral test. If you only have knowledge of grade five theory, there will be some oral test that you can't really uh, tackle. So you need to know the theory before you can formulate a proper answer to your oral test. It is another qualification on your portfolio Nowadays, many music teachers have many qualifications on their portfolio. And to stand out, you better have more and higher qualifications than others. And it's quite common for teachers to advertise that they have a, an ABRSM grade eight music theory, even though they are not actually teaching music theory. It's kind of a nice thing to have and to show that you have uh, breadth and depth in your knowledge. And learning grade eight theory will make you a better theory teacher at the grade one to five level. If you have only learned theory up to grade five, you probably have some problems here and there teaching grade five theory. So it's much better to, for you to have advanced theory so that you can teach the beginning and intermediate levels of music theory. Learning music theory also makes you a better all-round musician. If you know chord progressions or how things are constructed, you can uh, formulate a better interpretation of the pieces. And it's even more important if you are a teacher, because sometimes you are a, an instinctive musician. You know how you want to interpret a certain piece, but you may not know why. And to explain it to your students, you really need to know why you do certain things. And if you know theory at a more advanced level, it's more likely that you can explain the reasonings to your students. And at some parts of the world, grade eight music theory is actually a, 
uh, something you need to gain admission to music college or to university. At least that's what my colleagues in Hong Kong has told me. They said if you have passed grade 8 theory, then you get a head start uh, at the university. So it is another thing for you to consider. The ABRSM grade 8 music theory exam has evolved over the years. So I'm a little bit of a history nut. I look at the old exam papers online, like on eBay, uh, often. And I see a progression of the uh, exam. And I'll, I'll go into some uh, old exam papers at the end of the presentation. So there used to be questions on general music knowledge, music history, and musical forms. But that's no longer the case. Now the exam is only on music theory, uh, except that you need to know about some musical instruments also, how they work and how they are notated. So the exam consists of five questions with a total mark of 100. Questions 1 to 3 are creative questions. That means you have to compose something. Those three questions together carry a mark of 50. Questions 4 and 5 are analysis questions. So you have to read musical scores and answer some questions. Everything is black and white. It's either correct or incorrect. There's no uh, gray area. And those two questions also carry a total mark of 50. The first question is the continuation of a given opening of a passage from a baroque to sonata for two treble instruments and basso continue. The basso continue part will be given throughout. Oh, sorry, I, I, I mistyped. It should be full, full out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And fully figured. But you don't have to realize the keyboard part. So you only have to fill in the two treble parts for the chosen other. In my opinion, it is the least creative of the three creative questions. Even though you have to uh, write something. You really don't have to have that much imagination or idea to, to write because all the chords are laid out for you in the figured base. And you just have to basically look at the uh, figures and then fill in the top, top parts. So it is essential for you to understand figured base so that you can complete the harmony. And if you know all the chords, all the figures, and if you are careful, you should be able to get pretty close to a full mark. Experience in four-part choral writing is not required, but it is really, really helpful if you have that experience so that you can uh, do the choose another with more ease. So how do you tackle the question? First of all, you have to look at the treble instruments. What instruments are those? Because different instruments have different ranges. And it is definitely not good for you to write outside of the range of the instrument. So what are the usual choices for the treble instruments? You can get the violin, the oboe, the flute, or the recorder. And you have to bear in mind that for the Baroque period, the oboe and the flute were a little bit different. So the ranges were not as wide as today. For example, the Baroque flute, the lowest note is the D above the middle C. And the highest note is pretty much uh, G, uh, four ledger lines uh, um, on top of the triple clef. And for the Baroque oboe, the bottom note is the middle C, and then you don't have the C sharp above that. It's missing on the instrument. So the 
next highest uh, next higher note is the D, and then you have the full chromatic range up to the D, two ledger lines uh, on top of the treble clef. And for the recorder, you have to know whether it's the treble recorder or the decimal recorder or the tenor recorder. They have different ranges, and you can you can uh, look them up uh, before the exam. So to complete the trio sonata, you have to look for opportunities to reuse different materials. Because in Baroque music, there are many instances of imitations, particularly when you have two, uh, two treble parts. Very often, one part will copy the other part a few bars later. So you have to look at the harmony and see if anything repeats then you have to see if you can use the given material in a different part or in the same part to complete the parts. And if there is no uh, exact copy, then you have to see if there are any sequences, whether something goes down a step or goes up a step. Then you can copy everything and make everything uh, a step higher or a step lower. The seven chords must be prepared and resolved properly. Actually, I tell my students, if you see lots of seven chords in the question, this is a giveaway, because there's only one way to do it. You don't have to think. And it's better to have fewer options than to have too many options. If you have too many options, you may be thinking which option to take, and it takes a lot of time. And if you have only one option, then you pretty much do, do it the, the only uh, right way. When you, do, when you complete your true sonata, you don't have to do from start to finish. You can do it at a certain critical points, like um, at the seventh chord, and then expand back and, and after that point to complete the, the parts. And you have to bear in mind that not all chords have to be written in full. So why is that, you may ask. Uh, uh, your teacher may have told you, oh, the third of the chord must be there, otherwise it's not a chord. So why can you omit some notes uh, in a chord? Well, the basso continual part is not just a bass line. Usually there's a half a chord, filling out the harmonies. So even though not all notes are in the treble part and in the basso continual part, the keyboard player, a good keyboard player, will fill out the harmony um, himself or herself. So it's not uh, mandatory for you to have all the notes in the chord in the three parts. Although it's better if you can uh, have all the notes in, in those three parts. So the next question is the completion of an outline of a short passage for keyboard. Some knowledge of the styles practiced by composers from the time of Haydn onwards will be assumed. So for many people, uh, including myself and many of my students, this is the hardest question on the exam. It is particularly hard if you are not a keyboard player. Because if you are not a keyboard player, you would have seen far fewer piano pieces, and you don't know how piano pieces are written usually. So to operate out of a vacuum, uh, create something out of the blue is very difficult. A solid knowledge of common couple question is, is very important for this question. So you have to know usually what chords follow what chords, and what chord progressions are forbidden or uh, almost never seen in the classical and romantic periods. Because of that, if you have done grade 6 and grade 7 ABSI music theory, you'll be in a much better shape. Because there are questions uh, on grade 7 and grade 6 that force you to 
think about chord progressions and to look for a certain chord for a certain uh, musical passage. So you will have the training already. So what you uh, what do you have to be careful with this question? So you have to pay attention to the texture. If the given uh, parts have only two parts or three parts, then it's better for you to follow. Uh, if you write chords with seven notes or eight notes, then that probably is not going to be very appropriate for the piece. You should also look for opportunities to reuse the given material. There will be uh, there can be sequences or imitation or repeat of the material. So you should look for opportunity to reuse what you see on the page. There will be moderate, uh, modulation in this question. So you have to be able to spot the modulation and work out the harmony accordingly. So besides voice leading considerations, the writing should be pianistic. And pianists really have a huge advantage over non-pianists uh, uh, here because they know what feels right for the hand, what falls uh, well for the hands. And for non-pianists, you really have to study many piano pieces to get a sense of how composers write for the piano. And so you may ask, well, there are like literally tens of thousands of piano pieces written over the years. Where should you look, right? So the good news is you don't have to look earlier than Haydn because uh, the syllabus says that you will be examined on pieces from Haydn onwards. And I don't recall seeing too many 20th century pieces in past exam papers. So if you can study pieces from Haydn to the late Romantic period, probably you are in good shape. And I will start with pieces for children or for beginners, because there are fewer parts, the texture is leaner, it's easier to understand and easier for you to reproduce. I have never seen a piece by Brahms or by Rachmaninoff on the exam, so you probably don't need to look at those pieces, because if you have to write seven note chords or eight note chords, probably the exam will be finished by the time you finish this question. You won't have time for anything else. So I, I think it's rather unlikely that you get really fake texture in the piece that you see in the, on the exam. But but I only speaking uh, from my own experience. I, I don't I don't uh, write exam papers. So don't don't trust me one hundred percent. But that's just my gut feeling. Okay. So the third question carries twenty marks. It is a continuation of a given opening of a melody for a specified instrument. So you will get two choices. From past experience, one of the choices will be for a treble instrument, and the other choice will be for a bass instrument. And one of them will be uh, in a classical style, and the other one will be in a modern style. So how do you prepare for a question like this? Well, this really takes some imagination, right? Whether you can come up with a good melody uh, or, or take the um, given material and, and then run with it, takes some imagination. And it's really possible that you, you run out of idea just uh, during the exam. I mean, not everyone will have tunes getting out of their, their head all the time, right? It's, it's not an easy task to, to write a melody. But what you can do to maximize your chances is to get familiar with each orchestral instrument's range. That's the minimum. You have to know how low and how high each, each instrument goes so that you don't write outside of the range. And if you can get yourself familiar with the playing characteristics 
characteristic of each instrument that would be preferable. So what do I mean by that? For example, um, Osawa plays the flute, right? And every and you should know that the flute doesn't really doesn't play loud on the bottom of the range. It's, it's not it's not physically not possible to play very loud when you are at the bottom of the range of the flute. But the top range of the flute is really really loud. It's very difficult to to play soft. So if you didn't know that, and you wrote a piece with fortissimo at the bottom of the range and pianissimo for the top of the range for the foot, it's not going to give you a get you a very good mark, right? So that kind of characteristic of musical instruments, you should know if you want to do well on this question. Modulation is optional. You don't have to do it. If you do it and do it well, uh, I think it's better. But you should know how well you write and then you decide. And I think the minimum number of bars for this question is 12. So you have to decide, well, is it better for me to write for 12 bars or 16 bars? Usually the melody is more balanced if you write for 16 bars. But if you are error prone, maybe you want to limit yourself to 12 bars so that you don't get that many mistakes. So you really have to know yourself in that regard and see what's the best for you. So the next point may be obvious, but I have to say it. You should avoid making stupid mistakes. I've seen lot many people doing uh, these mistakes, so don't do it, right? So number one is you have to copy the opening correctly. That means you have to have all the notes, all the articulations, dynamics, um, uh, tempo marking, uh, the key signature and the time signature. If you can't even copy the opening correctly, then you are not going to get a very good mark in this question. And I'm sure most of us have read more music than we have written music. Many things that are kind of uh, second nature to us when we read music, it's not really second nature to us when we write music. If I ask you, do you have the time signature on every line of the music? Do you know the answer? Actually, you don't have the time signature of, on every line of the music. You only have it on the first line of the music. It's something that you may not know until you are asked to, to write music uh, by hand. And uh, for the same token, right? you don't repeat the keys. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I said it. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I didn't make a mistake. So uh, by the same token, you have to repeat the key signature on every line of the music. You cannot omit it. Otherwise, there's no, no way for people to know what key you are in. Right? You, can, you can tally the number of beats for each bar and know the time signature, but you can't do that for the key. So the key signature has to be there for every line. And you have to write complete bars. And if you start on an undercursus, then your last bar better not be a complete bar. Otherwise, it's, it's a big grammatical mistake. Yeah, this may sound obvious, but I've seen many people making this mistake, so I have to warn you about it. So how can you prepare for this question? I think it helps to listen to lots of music. I'll tell you my own story. When I took the exam uh, in my teens, I saw the opening, and then some musical ideas just flew out of my, flew out of my, my head, and I, and I had good melodies coming out, just like what I heard on the radio. And I don't think those melodies came out of the vacuum. I think I must have heard something similar on the radio over the years. And I just assimilated all those melodic ideas so that I can uh, write, write uh, my own melody when I was asked to. So if you listen to lots of music, you stand a better chance of coming up with a good melody. 
And you should also study and analyze famous melodies or pieces you like. See how those melodies are constructed. What what devices the composers use? Did they use sequence or repetition or or inversion or whatever? Right. If you know how they constructed a good melody, then there's a better chance for you to reverse engineer and write your own good melody. And beyond that, you, it just takes luck because you may have lots of idea, you may have no idea on the day of the exam uh, that you can't control, or you may get an opening that you don't like or you don't have affinity for. Then uh, you just have to do your best. So the last two questions are analysis question. They carry 25 marks each. So these questions are on short extracts of music written for piano or for uh, in open score for voices or for any combination of instruments or voices. In recent years, usually question four is on piano or on chamber music with piano. And question five is on an orchestral score. I haven't seen any voices recently. They used to have orchestral pieces with voices for the question five, but that has become rare in recent years. So these questions are designed to test the candidate's knowledge of the elements and notation of music, including the realization of ornaments, the identification and notation of underlying harmonic structure, phrase structure, style, performance, and on the voices and instruments for which the works are written. So all the sub-questions uh, on questions four and five are objective. That means the answers can only be correct or incorrect. It cannot be uh, up to the interpretation of the examiners. And it is very important for you to understand that to pass questions four and five is not enough to answer every other question correctly. Because the pass mark is 66%. If you only answer every other question correctly, you get 50%, which is a fail. And if you only get 50% out of questions four and five, you have to have over 80% on questions one to three to pass the exam. And that's a really tough ask because um, there's, no, uh, there's no assurance that you can get such a high mark on, on uh, compositions. So you should try your best and try to get all the questions correct in questions four and five. And if you study well, and, are, and is careful. It's really not that difficult to get really high marks on questions four and five. So what do you have to prepare for questions four and five? You have to be familiar with all the standard diatonic and chromatic chords. So some typical chords they ask are omega six, like the Italian six, the French six, the German six, the Neapolitan six, dominant chord extensions, including the dominant seventh, dominant ninth, dominant eleventh, and dominant thirteenth. So you may ask, oh, what, what, what are dominant eleventh and dominant thirteenth? Well, you can think of the dominant eleventh as the dominant chord with an added fourth and the dominant 13th as a dominant chord with an added 6. That's another interpretation no, of, those, uh, of these uh, dominant extensions. The diminished 7, you all also have to be able to identify it, and the common diatonic chords and the inversions. You have to know them all. So you need to be able to identify these chords from the music code score. But you don't have to be able to 
to write any music with with this. For questions four and five, you have to be familiar with the common musical terms, especially in German and in French. So you may ask, why not in Italian? That's because in the 19th century, most Italian composers were busy writing operas. Very few of them wrote anything for the orchestra. So if you see an orchestral score, most likely it was not written for an, uh, by an Italian. And by the mid-Romantic period, many composers used their own national terms for music. So some German composers, they use German terms, and French composers have traditionally always used French terms, uh, by and large. So it's very likely for you to get German terms and French term, or French terms in question 5 or question 4. And you should be familiar with all the orchestral instruments, particularly their transpositions. It's a popular question uh, to ask you to transpose a, uh, a part for an orchestral instrument into the um, concert pitch or vice versa. And you also need to know the instrument's names in Italian, German, French and in English. Because if you don't know and the orchestral score is in French, then you, you won't know which instrument is which. And you should not forget about the alto clef and the tenor clef, because they may ask you to transpose some of the music onto the alto clef or onto the tenor clef. And if you don't remember how to write those clefs, or how to write the key signatures in those graphs, then you will lose mark on those questions. So how do you prepare for uh, questions 4 and 5? So for question 5, you should study lots of orchestral scores. And I think that's much easier than when I was a student. When I was a student, I had to go to the library to borrow um, an orchestral score because there was no internet or very little internet and no IMSLP at that time. And now you can go to IMSLP and study hundreds or thousands of orchestral score for free. And there's really no excuse for you not to do that. The more orchestral scores you have read, the easier it will be for you to read the one in, on the exam. Essay type questions are no longer part of the exam. So you will not be asked to describe uh, a piece of music or to answer anything regarding history or uh, the structure of the music in, in a very uh, deep detail. So um, let me show you a older music theory paper. So this is a grade 6 music theory paper from the mid-1980s. And you can see that back then they asked a lot of stuff on history and on musical forms and, and on musical instruments. They even asked you uh, different ways of playing the cymbals or how many different types of trombones are there in a symphony orchestra. And thankfully for my students, these are no longer part of the exam. So they all can breathe a sigh of relief because they, they think that it's uh, quite tricky to do something like this. But you still have to know some basics about musical instruments. For example, question C, uh, the first one. These terms like uh, Senza Sordini, Suti, Ponticello, Collegno, uh, these are uh, methods of playing uh, stringed instruments. And you still need to know, know this, because on question 5, there may be performance uh, directions like this that you'll be asked to explain. 
but uh, things like question B here, these are no longer asked. Or question A, which pieces were written by whom? Those are not part of the exam anymore. And I found another old exam paper. This was a grade 8 exam paper, also from the mid-1980s. Actually, I think it's quite fun. Well, maybe fun for, for me, but not fun for the candidates. That, that you be asked to identify pieces from the given openings. Well, I think for this one, you, it really helps if you have um, perfect pitch or if you can cite the same. Because otherwise, you really need to know the piece well to be, in it, to be able to identify them. And all of the 10, I think I only know 9. But I think back then you only needed to know three of them to, to get a full mark for this question. So I think I would have done okay. But this is no longer part of the exam. But it's just for historical interest that I show here. So even with a solid background in grade 5 theory, you would need at least half a year or up to a year or even over a year of, of regular lessons to get to the grade A level. And now that the grade 5 theory, the scope is a little bit reduced, you may need even more time to get to the grade 8 level. Grade 6 and grade 7 are not mandatory for grade 8 theory, but if you know the material from those grades well, you'll be much more solid for grade 8. So you may not have to take those lower grade exams, but if you know the material, then you'll be in much better shape for grade 8. So to prepare for the exam, study lots of music. Look at lots of piano scores, lots of orchestral scores. I don't think you can look at lots of scores for two sonatas. Because back then, the two sonatas were only written in parts, not in score. So you will have a part for the viol uh, first violin, the part, a part for the second violin, and a part for the basso continue. But you can't see all three together. So it's a little bit harder for you to study the, the actual examples of two sonatas. So for that, I think you, you can listen to examples of two sonatas to get an idea of how composers wrote those pieces. You should build a strong foundation in music theory before you tackle the exam. So as I said, you have to know the common chords really well. And how do you know the common chords really well? It, it, may, be, it may sound funny, but if you practice and memorize your scales, arpeggios, dominant sevens, and diminished sevens, you will know them well. If you have to count the interval one by one and to construct a, a chord, I think you run out of time for the exam. When I took the exam or when I do the questions, I knew all the dominant sevens and the diminished sevens by heart. I, I, when I see the notes, I know uh, what, uh, what kind of uh, uh, scales uh, or what kind of chords are, are those because I practice them really well and I'm, I memorize them really well. I got full marks on my grade 8 uh, scales. So that's how well I, I know them and I can still play all the scales from memory perfectly today even though I haven't practiced for 20 years. So you really need to practice your instruments, uh, the scales, really well before you take the exam. That's my advice if you want to do a good job. And last but not least, find a good teacher. And I mean a really, really good teacher. Personally, I think it's much, much harder to teach grade 8 theory than to t teach grade 8 practical. It's very difficult. When I took the exam, only two people in Hong Kong got a distinction uh, that year. I was one of them. So I, I was already very good. But I never felt comfortable teaching music theory until I spent an entire year 
reading different books, learning everything uh, again, to know everything inside out before I felt comfortable teaching. Because you may lock yourself uh, out of an exam, you may not understand everything, but you can still get a distinction. But to teach a student and to be able to explain everything in great details, you really need to have a much higher level of understanding of the material. So if you want to teach grade 8 theory and teach it well, you really need to uh, study really well first. So I think that's all I have uh, today for my presentation. So maybe Sarah can open the floor for questions. Um, there's, you've brought back a few memories for me. And one memory that um, I always tell students, when I did my grade seven, this was A, Amy B, but the same sort of thing. It had this question, it said key, there was a piece, and then it said key underneath. And even though, of course, I know what the key is, in that moment in the exam, I'm here imagining a key for a door. And, and just see, they're going, what on earth do they want a key for a door in a theory exam? And I asked, I put up my hand and asked, and I said, I don't understand why they're asking me for a key. And she's like, we're not allowed to tell you the answers. And I think I learned, then I thought, well, I'll leave it till later. And of course, you know, within a few questions, like, oh, how could my brain have been on such a strange path? To, to, to be thinking about door keys. And I think that's the really important when we're doing grade eight or any exam really, is if we're stuck on something, don't stay on it. Go to something else. Because sometimes it's just sudden, particularly if you know your work well, it's your brain can be in all sorts of weird places in the exam room. But the um, yeah. the five, I wanted to bring up about the five nines and five thirteens, because I, I, I remember in all the, when I was doing all the past papers for ABRS in grade eight, mm -hmm that they give you three notes in a chord. And so it wasn't, it's like, what chord could this be? So if you get a chord in the exam and you're not sure what the chord is, write out what all the, the five, five, seven, five, nine, five, thirteen options are. And you might find that those three notes actually fit into one of those chords. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. And I tell students, if you don't know what chord it is, you can try the dominant 13th because it has all the notes in the scale. It's like a cluster, right? Uh, all all seven notes of the scale are on the dominant thirteenth. So you, if you get notes that you can uh, find relations uh, with, but every note is diatonic, then uh, it's quite likely that it can be a dominant extension. That would be your your first guess. And and so you brought up a good point. Sometimes you get stuck on a question in the exam. So this is what I told my students. You start with the hardest question for yourself, maybe not complete it, do so much that until you, you get stuck and then move on to the easy question and then come back to the hard question. Maybe by the time you come back, your, your brain would have unfreeze, have unfrozen, I mean. Yeah. So it's a, it's a strategy. And before you take the actual exam, I think it's good for you to um, allocate three hours of quiet time and try the exam in under exam conditions. You have to see mm -hmm. how fast you work. Because if you can do a great job in six hours, it's not going to get you a very good mark for this exam. You have to do a good job in three hours. There's a time limit there. I don't I don't know um, exactly who's in who's watching today whether it's students or, or teachers, but one thing that I've always done uh, is I insist students do past papers and I don't care if it's current syllabus or a bit older but past papers three times and they need to do it until they're getting 95 and I know it's the same paper but the fact that they're redoing it as an exam makes helps them memorize that and as many past papers as possible um until yes we can do them easily and well under the time limit not just within the three hours but in an hour and a half if you can do the pa past paper in an hour and a half you'll be able to manage in the exam room so that's that's a one of my strategies for when i do exams and my students now claire's asked um you talk about the difference between the old syllabus and the current one 
And I noticed that the list of prerequisites that mention grade eight theory actually specify the 1992 syllabus. Do you think the current syllabus is harder and those of us who did our grade eight before 1992 need to reset it with the current syllabus or is the earlier syllabus result okay? Actually, the current syllabus is a 1992 syllabus. I think there has been some minor adjustments since then, like they, they took out the essay type questions. And for question one, they used to just give you the opening and you have to complete the whole thing. And now it's more like freeing, filling in the blanks. And for question five, I don't think they, they used, when, when I took the exam, they, they asked questions on history. So I remember vividly uh, a past paper from 1992. They gave an extract of, a, uh, of the Seventh Symphony by Gustav Mahler. So they said this was written in 1907, I think. And they asked you to identify three other composers who wrote a symphony or symphonies in that decade. And I've asked many people that question. I've never had anyone uh, able to give me answers for three composers. So those questions are not in the exam anymore, but the syllabus is the same. But um, for the question whether um, power like a grade eight theory before 1992 is acceptable, that I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's better to ask ABSM that question. Because as you can see in, in the 80s, they ask different things. They ask you to identify tunes and, and, and describe tone poems, right? So whether that's still considered equivalent to today's exam, I'm not quite sure. Gen generally, they are. Um, gen generally, and again, sorry, Claire, we can't accept, answer specifically with authority, but generally, previous syllabus are are accepted um, as being equivalent to current syllabus. But we can we can find out and get back to you on that one. And another thing is when when I took grade eight theory for. LRSM entry, the grade 8 theory has to be less than five years old. I don't know if there's a time limit for, for uh, the current prerequisites. So if you took the theory more than 30 years ago, maybe it's expired. I, I don't know. You have to, uh, I think you have to check with APRSM. For the DIP teach, it wasn't, or at least they didn't tell me. Mine was mine was more than ten years old, and they accepted it for the okay. different. But, but when I took it, it was five year a five year limit, so there was a uh, shelf life for for your uh, prerequisites. And just for those who don't know, uh, we've noticed that Mr. Long posts um, about music from the nineteen thirties on the forum when he clearly did the exams. So. <laughs> Um, anyway, sorry, back to seriousness. Um, now, Rachel's asked, any book, do you, what, what books do you recommend or is there any book you recommend to help prepare for grade eight theory? I really like the old um, music theory in practice. So we, um, grade one to five are still in circulation. They are very much still in use, but grade six to eight somehow have I, I believe they have been discontinued. And I, I think those books are really excellent because they gave you good advice on how to uh, compose or how to tackle questions. If you can get your hands on a second-hand copy or better still, a, a brand new unused copy from back then, then I think those would be good. And if you can't do that, the, um, the books that are uh, the white cover book, I don't know the title, like the um, the current ABRSM books um, with the white cover, Th those would be pretty good. My, my favourite book, um, Rachel, is Dulcie Holland's Harmony in Practice, if you can get your hand on it. And it, it, it only covers the harmony section of the grade 8 exam, but it covers it really well. And I found that the... Um, the white book doesn't quite give you that grounding. And that's partly because it's such a big jump from grade five to grade six. Um, but the a few resources that I can recommend that I've made my students work through is the Oxford Student Harmony and then um, First Year Harmony, that's not Oxford. Love Lovelock. Lovelock. 
Love locks first to you, Harmony. So I make them summarize that and then summarize and Anna Butterworth's book, um, which I think is called Harmony in Practice. So um, no, that's what that's what Dulcie Hollands is called. And the Harmony, the big orange book by Anna Butterworth. So I make my students work through all of those before grade six, I find because I think that's where the foundation is. And grade six, seven, and eight just step up from there oh, my no, that's not harmony in practice my son was trying to show the book but i can't so they're the ones i recommend anyway um and it depends on what's available in which, whichever country you are in and now oh yes someone's mentioned Anna about those yes um edmund they're the eric taylor ones eric taylor wrote the music the 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 book that um that Mr. Long mentioned. Are there any online, Dominic's asking, do you know of any online resources for grade eight? Personally, um, I don't. There are online resources, but you have to be careful because there are good resources and there are also not so good resources. And uh, if you are just a student and you don't have lots of experience, it's hard for you to tell what's what. Uh, and, and particularly like, um, uh, four-part choral writing, uh, which is not grade eight, but it's a foundation to grade eight. I've seen even uh, like uh, very solid uh, teachers putting on some uh, wrong examples online. So you really have to be careful with online resources. And as I as I said in my uh, previous uh, talk, with the advent of the internet, I think the average quality of publication has gone down. If you want something uh, appear in print, you have to be pretty good. Uh, publishers are not going to gamble on an unknown author or to let something uh, junky right, uh, go through the QA. But anyone can post anything online. So you really have to be careful if you go with online resources. There, there is an on a software that's online. Um, it is a paid subscription. It's called Musician, um, or the oral program is called Aurelia. And what Mr. Long was talking about with um, with being very quick at recognized chords, Musician gives lots of practice at um, chord recognition and, um, and cadences and things like that. So while it's not specifically grade eight theory practice, it's that harmony aspect. For um, learning figured bass, I, I was, if I can find it, I will put it on the forum. When I was at uni, we actually had a figured bass textbook specifically for learning how to play from figured bass. And I think that's the best way to learn it is to actually work with something that's not just trying to summarize figured bass, but actually teach you how to work with it quite thoroughly. Maggie mentions they've got, um, Casey says, there's a handbook of music theory for grades six to eight. And um, Maggie mentions that Victoria Williams has um, written books that cover this topic as well. Um, now we're, we're reaching the end of the time. I'll just check Facebook to see if there's no questions on the Facebook live stream. Yeah. Do you have any final words, Mr. Long, before we call it a night slash morning? Well, um, a famous theory teacher uh, from the old days said, uh, if you want to be good, you should write a few per day. And I think if you want to be good at music theory, maybe you don't need to write one fugue per day, but maybe do one four-part chorale per day, then you'll be very good. And, and for those who are students here, the first time you do it, it feels like a nightmare, but it actually is quite mathematical. And the more times you do it, the, the quicker you get at it and you can do them in the exam is very difficult because you can't play it. If I'm doing a chorale at home, I might play it and I may even use some more adventurous chords than I'd use in an exam. But in an exam, as close to the full street as is possible, um, sticking to all the rules, but you can get very quick at putting it down and following the rules like a mathematical program. So it, it's daunting at the beginning, but it's not daunting forever be my words of wisdom i know i'm not the guest speaker tonight <laughs> well I have, a, I have a student who is who was new to the uh, four-part choral writing so today was the second week of her doing it last week he had uh, she had trouble but this week she was already doing almost uh, no mistakes 
very few mistakes. So it just takes practice. Some people get it faster, some people get it slower. But if you don't practice, you are not going to improve very much. That's what I can say. Well, thank you, Mr. Lung. Thank you for your time today and for sharing your wisdom from um, not since 1930. So 70 years of 80 years of teaching now. Um, but thank you so much for all this wisdom. And um, yeah, and thanks for having me. Yeah. And thank you, everybody who's joined us both on the live stream and in the in the room here. And everybody have a great day and good night. And we'll see you next time. So bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.